Thank you very much, Professor Pollock. Thank you all for coming, for braving the cold. And I really appreciate your coming for this second in a series of three conversations on anti-racism and health. Today I'm going to share with you some tools, some communication tools, some understanding tools for confronting racism denial. I also, especially for those who are streaming from the United States, need to acknowledge that today is celebrated in the United States as a federal holiday, the uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. birthday holiday. So I, we all owe so much to Dr. King, and I will make some references to some of his work at points throughout my talk. But uh, yeah, so I'm happy to have it on this day. So some of you might be saying, hmm, racism denial. Tools for confront. Whoever talked about racism denial? So let me give you some examples of what I have observed over time in the United States, as well as over the past six months in the UK, that general categories of what constitutes racism denial. And I'm sure that once I get going, you know, we can keep generating lists. But first of all, declaring affirmatively that racism doesn't exist is <laughs> definitely racism denial. We have politicians that have done that in the US. Even your Commission on Race and Ethnic Disparities here in the UK <laughs> said that racism doesn't exist. It's, structural racism is not a problem. Also, banning teaching about racism, equity, social justice, history, all of these things, there's quite a movement in my country, the anti-critical race theory activists who are banning any discussion because, again, they don't want to make their children uncomfortable with the possibility that racism might exist. Rolling back of affirmative action, which hasn't happened yet in the United States, but everybody is just holding onto the edge of their seats because the Supreme Court over there is poised uh, to make comments that everybody anticipates will either be taking away affirmative action or, or uh, closing it com you know, just part way. And why would they do that? Apparently there is no issue to be addressed, no problem to be solved. So these are all kind of acts of commission that I would characterize as examples of racism denial. But they're also acts of omission, like not saying the word racism, <laughs> which happens a lot. Right? Even, well, even when your work is on racism or anti-racism, using other words like equality, diversity, inclusion in the UK, or diversity, equity, and inclusion in the United States, or talking about disparities or disproportionalities, all of these are amazing things to work on. It's important for us to work on cultural competence, cultural humility, structural competence, on and on and on, even race. But if we, who are doing that work, never say the word racism in our, both of our national context of widespread and deeply held racism denial, we're actually complicit with that denial. Also, talking about poverty or even capitalism, so, and not talking about racism. This is something that I addressed a lot in my first talk when I shared with you my cliff analogy for understanding three levels of health intervention. There are the health services, there's addressing social determinants of health, including poverty and adverse neighborhood conditions, and then it's addressing the social determinants of equity, the systems of power that differentially distribute resources and populations along a cliff of, of challenge or opportunity, and those include racism, sexism, heterosexism, and the like. That's a very important distinction, and I find that many people get short. It's important for us to address things like neighborhood conditions and poverty and the like. That's very important, but it doesn't just so happen that some people, some populations are overrepresented in poverty while others are overrepresented in wealth, and we must address those factors that account for that, and also if we're trying to intervene, if you're addressing issues like adverse neighborhood conditions, you might decide, well, we'll put um, a bike path you know, in this neighborhood, or we'll put a, in the US, there's a lot of food deserts, or a grocery store, and the like. 
But if you're addressing the social determinants of equity, if you're addressing these systems of structured inequity, if you're addressing racism and other uh, isms, the question is not wh whether or not you're going to have a bike path. The question is who is at the table making those decisions? And attention to those things completely reorients your work as a health provider, as public health people, as people interested in justice and equity in a nation. I am already talking too long into my slides. I can already feel it, so let me <laughs> speed myself up. And I'm really looking forward. I, I'm planning to speak for an hour, and then we'll have 30 minutes for Q&A. Okay, so that's the plan. Then there are habits of mind that are also manifestations of racism denial. Like if you're advantaged, not even recognizing your unfair advantage, but feeling a sense of entitlement to everything you have, or a lack of curiosity about the circumstances of others, which is very easy to have in racially segregated areas in my country. You know, it's very easy to not even know how people on the other side of town are living, but to not even wonder, or to not wonder about the what reasons why to the history, how things have been structured. So anyway, I, I am going on and on and on, but what I have recognized is that racism denial is operating in both of our nations, in the United States and in the United Kingdom, like a huge black hole in our national landscape, much like the black holes in the universe. What do I mean by that? Well, the black holes in the universe are massive and powerful, and they suck everything into them, and they're invisible. So that even in the universe, when light comes near, the light gets sucked in. That is how racism denial is operating in our national contexts, plural. So how do we confront racism denial? Well, the first thing is to name racism, to say the whole word. I have. I think there have been at least five or six efforts here in the UK that have been really addressing racism and about anti-racism that I've heard all of their work. And then the name of the thing is something like the IGG or Teams or something like there's no even AR in it for anti-racism or no R for racism. There's, there's, you know, so you have to name racism because we must name a problem in order to even get started on the solution. So that's the real thing about confronting racism denial. But then this next step, asking how is racism operating here, then helps you landscape things to move to action. And then finally, we need to organize and strategize to act. And these three tasks are actually the tasks that were part of the national campaign against racism that I launched when I was president of the American Public Health Association in 2016. And these are the three steps of anti-racism as a process, which is sequential. You have to name racism and then ask how is racism operating here and then organize and strategize to act. But then once you go through those three steps, you're not done. They are sequential, but they're iterative. They're looping. And we have to go through again and again and again. So ask me some questions about that because I can talk at long a long time about that. But so now you came, so now I talked about racism denial, gave you some examples of what I'm thinking of when I say racism denial, have made the case, I hope, that we need to confront racism denial because if we don't, all of our other work trying to be anti-racism, trying to address oppressive opportunity structures, trying to dismantle or nullify uh, dehumanizing value systems, all of that work will be stymied because you will be facing this black hole that's sucking it all in and won't give you the time of day. So the tools that, well, first of all, there are four key messages when we name racism, when we confront racism and denial. The first is that racism exists. Yes, it does. The second is that racism is a system. The third is that racism saps the strength of the whole society. And the fourth is that, yes, we can act to dismantle racism. So I am going to share with you four allegories, four teaching stories, most of them based on something I saw with my own real eyes that will illustrate each of these messages. So for Racism Exist, I'm going to share with you Dual Reality, a restaurant saga. And if you came to my first 
public lecture, then you've seen this, but that's all right, review is okay. And you'll always, I, I am told that people listening to me always learn something new, even if they've heard me five or six times. So, <laughs> so, so just listen with different ears. But I'm going to do that because that's foundational. That message that racism exists is actually foundational in moving forward, right? My allegory for racism as a system is one that I call cement dust in our lungs. For illustrating that racism saps the strength of the whole society, as well as how does racism impact health, levels of racism, a gardener's tale. And finally, to illustrate that we can act to dismantle racism, life on a conveyor belt, moving to action. Now, honestly, I am prepared to share all four allegories, but if I get through, the, through three of them, I'll stop, take your questions, and then if somebody asks me as a question, would you please share that last one, Life on a Conveyor Belt, then we will reserve the last five minutes of the Q&A period for sharing that, just because I know how much time it takes, okay? So let's get started. Dual reality, a restaurant saga. This story, like most of my allegories, is based on something that I saw with my own real eyes. So I am going to ask you to step into my shoes as a first year medical student. And remember, this story is the one that helps us understand that racism exists. So here I am, a first year medical student. And on a particular Saturday, like on most, I had awakened early. And what did I do? I hit the books. And I hit them hard, because I was very studious, very diligent. And it was already mid-afternoon. I hadn't looked up. And some friends of mine came over, who were also medical students. So th did they distract me from my studies? Oh, no. We all got to studying together, long and hard, and now it was getting late, and I was getting hungry. We were all getting hungry, and I had no food in the apartment, which was so typical of me that my friends actually understood. <laughs> they were like, OK, Kamara, you don't have any food up in here, but we're hungry. So let's go into town and find something to eat. So we do. So we walk into town. We find a restaurant. We walk in. We sit down. Menus are presented. We order our food. Food is served, here we are eating. So maybe not the story about racism that people in my generation might have thought I was going to tell about racism exists in a restaurant. They may have thought I was going to say we didn't get service. But no, we were served, here we are eating. So now you're wondering, where are you going with this, Dr. Jones? OK, hold on. As I sat there with my friends eating, I looked across the room. And I noticed a sign that was a startling revelation to me about racism. So now I hope I've intrigued you. And you're wondering, well, Dr. Jones, what did the sign say? Well, what did the sign say? The sign said, open. So now maybe I've lost some of you. How could a sign that says open be a startling revelation about racism? So let me recap. Here we are sitting in a restaurant eating. I look up, I see a sign that says open, thinking no more about it. I assume other hungry people can walk in, sit down, order their food, and eat. But because I knew something about the two-sided nature of those signs, I recognized that indeed the restaurant was now closed due to the hour, but firmly closed. And that other hungry people, just a few feet away from me, but on the other side of that sign, would not be able to come in, sit down, order their food, and eat. And that's when I recognized that racism structures open, closed signs in our society. That racism structures, if you will, a dual reality. And for those who are sitting inside the restaurant, at the table of opportunity eating, and they look up and they see a sign that says open, they don't even recognize that there's a two-sided sign going on. Because it is difficult for any of us to recognize a system of inequity that privileges us. So for example, it is difficult for men to recognize male privilege and sexism. It is difficult for white Americans and white Brits to recognize white privilege and racism. In fact, it's difficult for all Americans to recognize our American privilege. Although, you know, we have been living it so large during the COVID pandemic with how much of the global supply of, of vaccine we sequestered and still have in our nation. Now, those on the outside are very well aware that there's a two-sided sign going on because it proclaims closed to them, but they can look through the window and see people inside eating. 
So back inside the restaurant, to those who ask, is there really a two-sided sign? Does racism really exist? I say, I know it's hard for you to know when you only see open. In fact, that's part of your privilege not to have to know. But once you do know, you can choose to act. So it's not a scary thing to name racism. It's actually an empowering thing to name racism. It doesn't even compel you to act, but it does equip you to act so that if you care about those on the other side of the sign, which is an if, but if you do, why, why you can even talk to the restaurant owner who is, after all, inside with you. And you can say, restaurant owner, they're hungry people outside. Why don't you open the door, let them come in? You'll make more money and all of the conversations we could have. Or maybe what you do is pass some food through the window, or maybe you'll try to tear down the sign or break through the door, but at least what you won't be doing is sitting back and saying, huh, wonder why those people don't just come on in and sit down and eat? Because you'll understand something about the two-sided nature of that sign that proclaims open to you. So this is the first of the four allegories I'm going to share with you. My challenge to you is to remember at least one of them well enough to share it with a family member, a coworker, or a neighbor, or something to tonight or tomorrow. Okay. So, and this is the story, as I say, when I have five or six minutes to share, to help people understand and then communicate on that racism exists. It's structuring two-sided or multi-sided signs. It's creating a dual or multifaceted reality. And I have actually started three-hour-long conversations on two occasions with the following question. How could people who were born inside the restaurant know something about the two-sided nature of that sign? And both times, they were three-hour long conversations because there are many ways to know. But let me say this. I am actually heartened that people who just two and a half years ago might have been sitting inside the restaurant eating and maybe craning to say, what are those people outside saying? Black lives matter. Don't they know all lives matter? More of those people are now actually proclaiming, yes, black lives matter. More people who were born inside the restaurant are saying the word racism, putting together the phrases structural racism, systemic racism. This is heartening. But here is my warning. Even to those of us who have put statements on our institutional web pages or something on our Facebook, or we've tweeted something out, Instagram, whatever you're doing, even for us, if all we do is say a thing, and remember, it's important to say a thing. I did say that naming racism is essential. You have to say the word in order to get started on the solution. But if that's all we do, then six months from now, we may forget why we said that thing, because racism denial is so staunchly held by so many, and it's so seductive that six months from now, we may fall into what I describe as, oh, the sleepiness, the somnolence of racism denial. So we have to go beyond naming racism to action. We need to tear down the sign. And of course, racism is not just a sign. It's the sign, it's the door, it's the lock. There's a whole system going on. We need to dismantle the lock, take the door off the hinges. But once we start acting, we will not forget why we are acting. So I am going to shift. This is the main dual reality story. I'm going to come back to it two more times because it's so essential. I mean, this is, this is the story. But in the meantime, you need to know for me, what do I mean when I say the word racism? I've said it about a gazillion times already. So when I say the word racism, what am I talking about? I am clear that I'm talking about a system. So I'm not talking about an individual character flaw, a personal moral failing, a psychiatric illness, as some people have suggested. And yes, it manifests in those in many other ways. But racism, in its essence, is a system of power. A system of doing what? A system of doing two things, of structuring opportunity and assigning value. And on what basis is the opportunity structured, and on what basis is the value assigned? Based on so-called race, based on the social interpretation of how one looks, which is what we call race in our countries. And what are the impacts of this system? Well, when people finally do understand that racism exists, then they acknowledge that it is unfairly disadvantaging some individuals and communities. That's good. But it shouldn't take any of us long to recognize that 
every unfair disadvantage has its reciprocal unfair advantage, so that racism is also unfairly advantaging other individuals and communities. That's the whole issue of unearned white privilege that we hardly ever talk about in the United States because it makes some people, especially some people who are living as white, uncomfortable. And I used to almost apologize. If I, you know, I've been doing these kinds of talks for a long time. And you know, in the before COVID times, if I would see people in the audience and I get to this and they start to twitch around and stuff, I would say, oh, I'm not trying to make anybody uncomfortable. I'd almost apologize. I say, if you feel uncomfortable, shake it off. Stay with me, <laughs> right? I'll tell you more stories, right? I don't apologize anymore. What I say is if acknowledging the reality of unearned white privilege makes any of us uncomfortable, we need to lean into that discomfort by reading more, reading history, going across town and staying a while, talking to strangers, lots of ways. We can talk about how you lean into that discomfort. And the, why do I say that? Because I have come to recognize that for all of us, the edge of our comfort for all of us is our growing edge. But there's a third impact of racism that many people miss, and that is that racism saps the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. And I tell you, I could talk a very long time on this, and I'm going to control myself, just to say that, for example, when we don't vigorously invest in the full, excellent public education of all of our children, because the blinders of racism that some people have, decision makers have, makes them believe there's no genius in these neighborhoods, in those boroughs, and in, in the barrios, the ghettos, on the reservations. We can get along very well, thank you, without those kids, when in fact, of course, there's genius in all of our communities. And if we were to only vigorously invest in that genius, we could be doing so much better as nations or even the world. Also, in the United States in particular, and I haven't really researched it so much in the UK yet, but the our, the fact that we are complacent with what I describe as a wholesale warehousing disproportionately of so many black and brown men in our prison system as if that doesn't separate us from human potential. And on and on and on. There are many ways that racism is sapping the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. And that loss, because we don't value all of us equally, right, is not even perceived by the society. When I think about the impending what might be the US Supreme Court taking away all of our affirmative action programs at universities, I was like, but what do they think that's gonna do to the nation, right? All of that talent that is being educated that still needs to have special things because racism is still existing and racism has had long, generational long impacts. What do they, they don't even perceive that as a threat to the nation. That is how, how I don't ha get the word for it, but how sad racism is, right? So I actually think that that impact of racism, how racism saps the strength of the whole society, is the impact, if we had to pick one, that I would lift up most urgently these days so that we would get more people filled with a sense of urgency to dismantle this system and put in its place a system in which all people can know and develop to their full potentials. That definition that I just gave you of racism can actually be generalized to be a definition of any system of structured inequity. Because some of you people are thinking, oh yeah, but what about this and what about that? that and so what is sexism, for example? That's a system of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on gender that unfairly disadvantages some, unfairly advantages others, and saps the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. And indeed, there are many axes of inequity operating in our societies today, intersecting in communities, intersecting in individuals, and all of these are at least risk markers for how opportunity is structured and value is assigned, even as a smaller subset are actually risk factors in the production of disease. So in the United States context, often I will have done a whole hour, hour and a half, two hours of talking about racism, and then I drop this pearl, and people are like, oh, oh hold up, Dr. Jones. Then if you recognize all of this is going on, why have you spent your life on addressing race as the axis of inequity and racism as a system of structured inequity when you recognize all of this is going on? And my answer is clear. Racism is foundational in the history of the United States and its wealth, 
and in the history and the wealth of the United Kingdom. And yet many people are in staunch denial of its ever existence or continued existence and profoundly negative impacts on the health and well-being of our nations. So I am clear that all of us need to at least be actively anti-racism. So I don't even say anti-racist, because if you say anti-racist, some people might hear that and say, ooh, is she talking about me? No. No, we need to be actively anti-racism. We are talking about a system. And I think all of us need to at least be actively anti-racism, even as we also engage around all of these other axes of inequity and their associated systems of structured inequity. And to the extent that we're able to dismantle the mechanisms of racism, the other struggles will benefit as well. I told you I was going to come back twice to these colors, at least. So there are a lot of people who don't want to think about all these axes of structured and, you know, axes of inequity or systems of structured inequity. There are many, many people in this country, in the US, in the world, who value comfort. And there are many people who value social justice in the US, in the UK, and in the world. And in the current status quo, valuing comfort and valuing social justice are at almost polar opposite ends of a value system. I'm not saying you can't be comfortable and be working on social justice, but if you value comfort, if that is what orders your steps, if you will, unless you expand the comfort for whom to a very big all-inclusive we, then they are at polar opposite ends of each other. And in fact, I came as I was thinking about this understanding to understand that valuing comfort, those people who value comfort, are very much like those who were born inside the restaurant, sitting at the table of opportunity, eating, right? They are benefited by the status quo. That's why they value the comfort of the status quo. They do not wonder why nobody else is entering. They may not even realize or ask, why isn't anybody else entering? They might be so so consumed with the delicious food and the company that they think is all the brilliance in the world that they don't even notice. They certainly don't want to examine the sign. They may have heard a rumor that there is a two-sided sign going on, right? But they are passing laws across the United States, at least, banning people from going to see, does the other side really say closed, right? Because it might make their children uncomfortable, all of these anti-critical race theory efforts. They don't care to know what the outsiders are saying. They're not even craning to try to hear, right? And they don't believe an outsider could ever add to their conversation. Now, they may have been cajoled because of EDI efforts and whatever to thinking they need to bring an outsider to their, to their proceedings, right? But even when they do that, they think, well, maybe it'll make a more politically correct picture. But they really don't think that that person could bring genius and new insights and new experiences and the like. Furthermore, they don't even wonder how the food that they're eating got there. And they don't recognize that the people on the outside who can't come in and eat are the ones who grew the food, transported the food, came, brought it around to the kitchen, cooked the food, coming out and serving it but can't eat in the restaurant. And finally, they do not want to budge from their seats at the table. They very jealously guard their privilege. Now, those who value social justice value social justice because they know two things. The first thing they know is that there is a two-sided sign going on. Many of them know that because they were born outside the restaurant. They see the sign say closed, but they can look through the window and see people inside eating. But they also know whether wherever they were born or however they came to that knowledge of the two-sided sign, they also know that the operation of that two-sided sign saps the strength of the whole society. Now, I am not suggesting that the circumstances of our birth completely determine our value system. And I acknowledge that there are people who were born inside the restaurant who wonder what are those people outside saying? Why aren't more people coming in? They might just have a curiosity about the lives of others, including others who have less than what they have. Because very often, when we compare ourselves to others, we compare ourselves to others who have more than what we have. We don't even consider those who have less. And they will find their way. Um, outside, and they will see the reality of the closed sign, and they will understand the common humanity of the people who were born and are finding themselves in different circumstances. So that is good. And I acknowledge that there are people who were born outside the restaurant 
who can get lots and lots of degrees and do lots and lots of stuff and make lots and lots of promises, some of which might be to deny ever even seeing that there was a closed side of that sign, right? And they can make their way in. Often they are placed near the window so that the other outsiders can see that they're there. Often they use their position near the window, near the door, maybe sometimes to put their foot in the door to keep, keep it open so more people can come in. But sometimes they are the biggest gatekeepers, keeping other people, stopping people from coming in. I'm not, we can go into, we can talk about people we know, we can talk about lots of situations, but, uh, <laughs> but we're not going there. All I have to say that is that part of our job, part of our job in confronting racism denial is actually to effect a shift in values, to move more people from valuing comfort to valuing social justice, even as we acknowledge that in the status quo in today's world, valuing social justice may not always or maybe not ever be comfortable. But that is part of our job. OK, so you're going to see the dual reality one more time, but not, not right now. We're going to sh fully shift gears. And, ooh, I only have 20 minutes, so this is going to be very fast. Oh, but we started late. We, we started late. <laughs> we did. We did. Yeah. Not two hours late, but. Uh, <laughs> so, so in order to set up the second story that I'm going to share with you, which is uh, my levels of racism, a gardener's tale, I'm first going to describe three levels of racism that I, this is like now 25-year-old work of mine, but I was trying to understand how could racism turn into health outcomes. I am a family physician after all. I am a, a PhD epidemiologist after all. So I'm interested in health as well as education, housing, the criminal legal system and all of it, right? But I was wondering, how does racism turn into differences in the numbers of our mothers dying around pregnancy-related things, right, by race? Why does it turn into differences in how many of our babies die before their first birthday? So that's an infant mortality rate by race. How does it turn into differences in COVID morbidity and mortality? How, you know, asthma and diabetes and on and on. And so I described three levels of racism, institutionalized, which we would now call structural, personally mediated, which some people call interpersonal. But because I am so clear that racism is a system, I don't even put it interpersonal. I call it personally mediated. It's the system mediated through people. And then internalized. So let me briefly, if I don't wax eloquent, right, briefly describe, define each of these levels, and then uh, give you examples of how they can impact health, and then illustrate them with my Gardner's Tale allegory. So, Institutionalized or structural racism is the system, if you will. It's the constellation of structures, policies, practices, norms, and values that result in differential access to the goods, services, and opportunities of society by race. You will notice that all of my definitions are something that's differential by race. So this is the kind of racism that doesn't require an identifiable perpetrator because it's been institutionalized in our laws and customs and background norms. This is the kind of racism that shows up as inherited disadvantage or as reciprocal inherited advantage. This is the kind of racism that we see both in terms of material conditions and in terms of access to power. So examples include differential access by race to quality housing excellent educational opportunities, equal employment opportunities, same level of income at the same level of employment by race, and, and clearly those things impact health. Differential access to medical facilities, which is more of a problem in the United States than here because you have you know, a national health system, but you know that's also very neighborhood-based, and then if the neighborhoods have different resources or just you know all of it, so I'm trying to figure that out. But differential access to medical facilities and in the US, that includes financial access. <laughs> it includes physical access. It includes linguistic access. Differential access to a clean environment. And the very well documented, at least in the US context, of the disproportionate placement of toxic dump sites and bus transfer stations and the like in communities of color, what's been described as environmental racism. And then in terms of, so you know, material conditions, that's that stuff. In terms of access to power, access to power as information, so differential access to health information or even information about our own histories. Differential access to resources, so not just capital resources, but social networking resources, and differential access to voice, voice in government, voice in media, and the like. 
Sometimes in the US, I haven't tried it out here yet. You guys are my first like public audience hearing this, but, and you guys are kindly holding your questions to the end. But sometimes in the US, where we're very brash, somebody will lift up their hand about now and they'll say, excuse me, Dr. Jones, look at that top set of examples where you talk about housing, education, employment, income. Isn't that what we call social class? Why do you have that on the slide about racism? Are you talking about racism or are you really, really talking about social class? This is a very important question there as well as here because here, the social class analysis is the default analysis, right? I mean, that is the thing that makes people, because your class system is so much, has so much more light on it than the US class system where we pretend that it's everybody's middle class or is fluid or whatever and it's not, right? But here, your caste system, your I, I'm seeing the social class among especially white folks here is a, the white caste system, the British caste system, is so clear to you, right, that, that, you, that you acknowledge that and then you don't acknowledge the other things, right? But, um, so I'm gonna address it for both countries. So I want to answer that question. Why do I have those things here? Am I talking about social class, really, and it's not racism? And my answer starts with the observation, first of all, that it doesn't just so happen that people of color in the US and the UK are overrepresented in poverty, not all groups, but are overrepresented in poverty while white people, at least in the US, are overrepresented in wealth. That is not, just, and in the UK, but I haven't looked at all the data, so somebody here, you're gonna educate me if I need to know some more stuff, right? But that is not just a happenstance. And for each marginalized, stigmatized, oppressed group of color, there's been some initial historical injustice, right? So for American Indians in the US, the initial historical injustice was the taking of the land, the near genocide, moving people to survivors' re reservations. And then, oops, something good was found under one reserved area, got to move the people someplace else, right? I could go on and on about Mexicans who never crossed our southern border, but the border crossed them and they found themselves in New Mexico and they're still being harassed about Chinese immigrants who were brought to, to build our railroad system and then with the Chinese exclusion acts, unable by law to bring their families with them, unable by law to marry. Did you know that during World War II, we interned Japanese Americans when we did not intern German Americans or Italian Americans, right? And, for people like me, African American, right? The initial historical injustice was the, t was the kidnapping of West African people, our importation across the Atlantic with tremendous loss of life in the Middle Passage, and then for the survivors and their progeny for generations and generations and generations, what I describe as the coerced usury of our unpaid labor for centuries to build that country. Now, when I start talking about uh, like that, some people might go, oh, Dr. Jones, there you go talking about slavery. Dr. Jones, we all recognize that slavery was an unfortunate chapter in our nation's history. But Dr. Jones, don't you know the enslaved people were emancipated by 1865? And we're now in 2023, which makes that 158 years ago. So Dr. Jones, all else being equal, don't you think the impacts of slavery would have washed out by now? Well, the answer is actually in the question, isn't it? All else being equal. All else has not been equal since 1865. All else still is not equal today. And there are present day contemporary structural factors that are perpetuating that and all of the other initial historical injustices that have affected people who have been stigmatized, oppressed, marginalized. And these Contemporary structural factors are part and parcel of structural racism. So when you ask me, am I talking about racism or am I really, really, really talking about social class, I say that the fact that we even see an association between social class and race is because of structural or institutionalized racism, the initial historical injustice and then the contemporary structural factors in our structures, policies, practices, norms, and values, the mechanisms of structural racism that are perpetuating those injustices. 
I'll say one more thing, and then really on the others, um, I'm going to go faster. But this is, like, like I said, that first story is the most important. This is the most important level of racism to really get a handle on. Structural uh, racism can be through acts of doing, acts of commission, as well as acts of not doing, acts of omission, and very often, structural racism shows up these days as lack of action in the face of need. It's a hallmark. Okay, I'm going to race through the other two levels. Personally mediated racism I define as differential assumptions about the abilities, motives, and intents of others by race, and then differential actions based on those assumptions. This is what most people think of when they hear the word racism. Somebody did something to somebody, includes the different idea, the prejudice, and the different action, the discrimination, and it can impact health in many ways. Police brutality, physician disrespect, a, a physician not giving a patient the full range of treatment options because the patient, the physician figures that patient wouldn't understand, couldn't afford, wouldn't comply, or whatever they assume about the patient. That's the subtle way of physician disrespect manifesting. It can also be quite blatant, like in the US history of uh, sterilization abuse, which has had many iterations in our nation's history. Shopkeeper vigilance being followed around in stores, or waiter indifference, not getting quick, respectful treatment. These are just examples of what some people call everyday racism, you know, the uh, Microaggressions, which only are micro to the aggressor, not to the aggressed, right? right. But the subtle communication of disrespect, which may uh, be related to elevated blood pressures in communities of color. They don't even go down at night, at least in our studies in the US. And teacher devaluation, very important. If a teacher looks at a young child and thinks that child can't learn and puts them off in some kind of, you know, uh, not good learner track. I don't know what you call your tracks here. but. <laughs> That child will never even know their full potential, much less have the opportunity to develop to their full potential. But even in medical school, even in graduate programs, when an instructor, when a professor takes your question at a low level of sophistication, as opposed to a high level of sophistication, it actually stops you from asking questions, doesn't it? I mean, it's just, so anyway, so all of these things, so like, like Structural racism, this level can be through acts of doing, acts of commission, as well as acts of not doing, acts of omission. But even more important to understand at this level is that it can be unintentional as well as intentional. You do not have to have intended to do something racist to have had a racist impact. Third level of racism, internalized racism. I also am describing something that's differential by race. Now, for members of structurally disadvantaged races, the definition is acceptance of negative messages about our own abilities and intrinsic worth. For members of structurally advantaged races, is that sense of entitlement. That's, that's how internalized racism shows up, which actually requires racism denial. Because if you feel entitled to what you have, then there cannot be an unfair system going on. I'm going to talk about the health impacts from the point of view of members of structurally disadvantaged races where it shows up as self-devaluation, feeling maybe I'm really not as good as, maybe I shouldn't try to you know, graduate from high school, your you know, colleges or you know, don't do A-levels or whatever, or, you know, don't apply for that job or try to live in that neighborhood. It shows up as the white man's ISIS colder syndrome. That's a phrase in the US, at least, black folks have been talking about since my parents' generation, at least, what it meant in their generation and what it still means for many of us today day, the white man's ice is colder, is say I'm black and I need a doctor. I might seek out a white doctor over a black doctor. Or I need a lawyer. I might go search for a white lawyer over a black lawyer. Or even if my lemonade were warm, I might go way down the street to get the white man's ice over the black man's ice, deeply believing that the white man's ice is colder, deeply internalizing the myth of white superiority. It turns into resignation, helplessness, hopelessness, which turns into a lot of self-destructive health behaviors. And really, it's about ex us, members of structurally disadvantaged races, accepting the limitations to our own full humanity of the box into which we've been placed. Now, I will say that internalized racism also affects members of structurally advantaged races. Um, I had a long time trying to figure out how could a sense of entitlement turn into bad health outcomes, but maybe a sense of entitlement thwarted, a sense of grievance, might be related to some of the, uh, what has been described in the US as uh, diseases of despair in white populations. So suicides, the second opioid epidemic, and the like. So, so now I'm going to uh, share with you my Gardner's Tale allegory. 
This story, like my first one that I shared with you, was based on something that I saw with my own real eyes. So let me tell you what I saw, and then we're going to make it a story about racism. Okay? So my husband and I had been married about a year when we moved down to Baltimore for me to finish my PhD at Hopkins, and we bought our first freestanding house. Cute little house, big wraparound porch with flower boxes dotted all over the porch. Now we bought this house in October, which in Baltimore, Maryland is not the time to plant, so we held off on planting in these flower boxes. But when spring came, my husband, who loves to garden, he ran out with our marigold seed, going to decorate our cute little house, right? And then he came right back in, and he said, Kamara, there, some of these boxes have dirt in them, but some of the boxes are empty. I need to go down to the gardening store. So he does. He goes down to the gardening store, and he comes back hauling big old bags of potting soil, right? And then we fill up those empty boxes. And then we take equal numbers of our marigold seeds and we put them in all of the boxes. And then we water all of the boxes equally. And by this time, because I am not the gardener in the family, by this time I was exhausted, right? So I figured I'm just going to sit back and be delighted. It wasn't until three weeks later, as I was walking out of my front door onto my porch, that I finally paid attention to these flower boxes. And what I saw made me literally stop in my tracks. Because what I saw made me think that we had planted completely different species in some boxes versus others. Because some of the boxes were full of plants, and they were tall, vigorous looking plants. And some of the boxes just had a few plants in them, and they were kind of scrawny and scraggly looking. And then I realized what had happened. That potting soil that my husband had bought turned out to be rich, fertile soil. So that every single seed planted in the rich, fertile soil had sprouted. The strong seed had grown very tall and vigorous, but even the weak seed had made it halfway up. But that old soil that we had found there turned out to be poor, rocky soil. So the weak seed planted in the poor, rocky soil just died. But even the strong seed in the poor, rocky soil had to struggle to make it to a middling height. And I've seen a few of you guys nod. So maybe you're gardeners too. And maybe you've composted half of your garden, right? And maybe you've seen this image with your own real eyes. And the image, of course, is about the importance of the soil, the importance of the environment. But now I'm going to take this image and I'm going to make it a story about racism by introducing a gardener. So now we have a gardener who has two flower boxes, one which she knows to have rich, fertile soil, and one which she knows to have poor, rocky soil. And she has seed for the same kind of flowers, except some of the seed is going to produce red blossoms, and some of the seed is going to produce pink blossoms. And the gardener prefers red over pink. So what does she do? She puts the red seed in the rich, fertile soil, pink seed over in the poor, rocky soil. And three weeks later, in her flower boxes, she sees what I saw in mine. In that rich, fertile soil, all the red seed in the, that was planted in the rich, fertile soil sprouts. The strong red seed, tall and vigorous, weak red seed makes it halfway up. In that poor, rocky soil, the weak pink seed dies. Here comes the strong pink seed, struggling to make it to a middling height. And then in those two flower boxes, those flowers go to seed. And the next year, the same thing happens. And then those flowers go to seed. And year after year after year after year, the same thing happens until finally, oh, about 10 years later, the gardener is looking at her flower boxes and she says, you know, I was right to prefer red over pink. So we're going to interrupt the story there to say the first part of this story is how structural racism works. We had the initial historical injustice of the separation of the seed into the two types of soil, the contemporary structural factors of the flower boxes keeping the soil separate, and then through lack of action, inaction in the face of need, perpetuation of the inequity. But let's pick the story back up to say, well, where is personally mediated racism in this garden? Well, the garden is looking at the red flowers and thinking, oh, those red flowers are so beautiful. Then she looks at the pink flowers and she says, Oh, those pink flowers sure are scrawny and scraggly, so she plucks off the pink blossoms before they can even go to seed. Or maybe she notices that a pink seed has blown into the rich, fertile soil, so she plucks it out before it can establish itself, which is some of the anti-affirmative action stuff that is still going on to this day. And where would internalized racism be in the garden? Well, the red flowers are just living their lives, enjoying being red, many of them not acknowledging or perhaps not even understanding that they're benefiting from enriched soil. Pink flowers are looking over at red thinking, red is mighty fine, and wishing with all their hearts that they too could be red. And here come the bees. 
minding their own business, collecting nectar, but pollinating at the same time. So here comes a bee, bzzz, over to one of the pink flowers, and then bzzz, to another pink flower, and then bzzz, to this pink flower, and this flower's like, get away from me, bee, don't bring me any of that pink pollen. I prefer the red, because the pink flower has internalized that red is better than pink. So now the question arises, what do we do to set things right in the garden? Well, we could, start by, we could start by addressing the internalized racism. So we can go over to the pink flowers and we can say, pink is beautiful, power to the pink. And that is an important intervention. It is, indeed. But if that's all we do, it's not going to change the situation that those pink flowers find themselves in. So you say, oh, oh OK, well, let's address the personally mediated racism. Let's have a conversation with the gardener. Or better yet, let's have a workplace multicultural workshop for the gardener, which is all good. <laughs> so we do. And in the workshop, we say, dear gardener, would you please stop plucking those pink flowers? And maybe she will, maybe she won't. But even if she does, it's still not going to change the situation in which those pink flowers find themselves. What we really need to do if we want to set things right in the garden is address the institutionalized or structural racism, which means we need to break down the boxes and mix up the soil. Or, you know, if you need to have separate boxes, I guess that's all right too, although it does make it much easier for that same gardener to continue segregating resources going forward. But if you have to keep separate boxes, it means you must enrich that poor rocky soil until it is as rich as the rich fertile soil. And when you do that, the pink flowers will flourish. They'll be looking beautiful, grand, and glorious. So that in that intervention on the structural racism, you will also have addressed the internalized racism, because now pink will no longer be looking over at red, thinking red is better, or wanting to be red. And in that intervention on the structural, you may also address the personally mediated racism. Now, the original gardener may have to go to her grave preferring red over pink, but her children who grow up and see the flowers equally beautiful will be less likely to have those same attitudes. So this story has been to illustrate the three levels of racism, to say that if we want to set things right in the garden, we must at least address the structural racism. Good to address all the levels at the same time, but at least address the structural racism. And when we do that, the other levels may take care of themselves. But there's a very important question that I haven't raised yet, which is, who is the gardener? After all, the gardener is the one that I gave the power to decide, the power to act, control of resources, which are actually the elements of self-determination. Who is the gardener? Well, in the US context, the gardener includes the government. It's a huge part of the gardener, but not the only part. So there are media, foundations, corporations, communities to the extent they have self-determination. But whoever the gardener is, it is dangerous when the gardener is allied with one group. I painted her red. That's why she prefers red over pink. And it's also dangerous when she's not concerned with equity, when she can look at her flower boxes and think that her garden is beautiful, thank you because she's not even counting the pink flowers as part of her garden. She doesn't even understand that what she is doing, that this racism is sapping the strength of the whole society, that when a garden prize committee comes by, she will never get a prize, because her garden looks bad because of the inequity that is so manifest in it. So there's a whole new set of questions now. What do we do about the gardener? Do we make the gardener striped or polka dotted or fuchsia? Do the pink flowers have to grow or recruit their own gardener? There are many questions that I hope we will discuss or that here's a second story that you're supposed to take and share with your neighbors, your family, you know, coworkers, whatever. But I'm going to share with you two, two questions and then we're going to um, then we're going to whiz through the last thing I was going to say, right? Whiz! Because I want to hear your questions. Okay. But here are two that I always share now. The first is, I was asked, excuse me, Dr. Jones, but why should the red flowers share their soil? When I heard that question, I loved that question because it showed me the power of this story to start conversations about racism that would be otherwise difficult if we were talking about racism between you and me. My answer to that question, why should the red flowers share their soil, is that actually that soil doesn't belong to the red flowers. It belongs to the whole garden. Well, we can ponder that for a minute. But here's the second question. What if that's not the original gardener we're looking at? What if that's the gardener's great, 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 great grandchild? Here we are. And the great, 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 great grandchild has always seen the flowers looking like that, may not even think there is a problem to be solved, right? So there are three steps with that. The first is we must make the differences in the height and vigor of the pink and red flowers a problem requiring urgent solution. We put it on our urgent action agenda. 
But now, now it's on the agenda, what are we gonna do about it? So step two is we must make the flower boxes transparent. We must be talking about the differences in the quality of the soil so that we can address the differences in the quality of the soil. And step three, as we make those flower boxes transparent, we must make sure that everybody understands that the pink seed did not just go launch themselves into that poor rocky soil, right? So we must talk about history and we must talk about how the gardener's initial preference for red over pink, which some people would describe as cultural racism, which in the US and the UK settings is white supremacist ideology and you know, all over Europe, okay? We must address that directly, right? Because if we don't, if we don't, even if we were able to compel that red gardener today to enrich the poor rocky soil today until it was as rich as the rich fertile soil, if she continues to prefer red over pink, she will continue to privilege red over pink going forward. So when I define racism as a system of doing two things, structuring opportunity and assigning value, we must address both of those things. That's a new aha. It's not in the original Gardner's Tale that was published 23 years ago, right? That's a new aha for me. Okay, I think I have seven more minutes. Okay, I think I do have seven more minutes. So I am, <laughs> so I just want to briefly go through this, and we can talk about this more uh, thing. But there are, I used to call them, uh, there are actually seven things, but there are four of these things that I used to call societal barriers or cultural barriers or values targets for anti-racism action. There are four that are the roots of racism denial. Our narrow focus on the individual, I think these are in common between the US and the UK, okay? Our narrow focus on the individual, which makes systems and structures either invisible or seemingly irrelevant. So you say racism is a system, system schmistum, what system, right? Right? And it means our self-interest is very narrowly defined. If I don't even count my aunts and uncles and cousins as part of self, I'm certainly not gonna count those people on the other side of town or in the other borough as part of me. Gives us a limited sense of interdependence there, but for the grace of God go I. We are all in this together. I am my brother's and my sister's keeper. And it also limits our sense of efficacy because it's like, well, what can I do about something like that? When actually the more productive question would be, what can we do? and we need to have a sense of collective efficacy. The second of these four roots of racism denial is what I describe as an ahistorical stance. So we act in the US and here, like the present were disconnected from the past. And as if the current distribution of advantage and disadvantage were just a happenstance. And if you are ahistorical in how you are in the world, it even limits how you think about change. Because if you were born and things were a certain way, you think they've always been that way and always need to stay that way, and you don't even uh, learn about the need for or the strategies for change. The third, the myth of meritocracy. This is the myth, the storyline that goes, if you work hard, you will make it. I give you that most people who have made it have worked hard. I didn't say everybody who's made it has worked hard because you have royalty here. We got <laughs> former presidents there, right? Okay, but most people who have made it have worked hard, but there are many, many people working just as hard or harder who will never make it because of an uneven playing field which has been structured and is being perpetuated by racism, sexism, heterosexism. All of these systems are structured in equity. And if we deny the existence or pertinence of these systems, when we deny racism, then we blame those who haven't made it for being lazy or stupid. And I said before, there are many ways to deny racism. One is to say, I don't think racism exists. Another is to be working on all of the good stuff we're working on, but never say the word racism because if we never say the word racism in our cultural, societal, national context of deeply held, staunchly held, widely, very seductive racism denial. We're complicit with that racism denial. And the fourth root of racism denial is white supremacist ideology. I put that last, even when I'm talking about the seven things, I put it last because I don't want people to tune out. But I'm not trying to say something like a lightning rod, right? White supremacist ideology is the false idea of a hierarchy and human valuation by race. There is no such hierarchy. And the falser notion that not only is there a hierarchy, but that would put white people at the top as the ideal or the norm. But this false idea is giving many people who are living as white a sense of entitlement. It has resulted in the devaluation and the dehumanization of people of color, at least in my country. And 
fear at the browning of America that's underlying our political divide today and may have been underlying, I don't know what was going on with Brexit, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so this is a very quick allegory and then we're gonna wrap it up. We're gonna have questions and then somebody can beg me to do the last allegory if you want, okay. But <laughs> This one, so you remember, this third allegory was about racism as a system. I call this cement dust in our lungs. And this one isn't based on something with my own little real life experience. It's just like an idea. Okay, when I say cement dust, I want you to think cement dust. And I want you to think racism. So imagine there's a cement factory spewing cement dust. And the cement dust fills the air. And if any of us are anywhere around that factory for any amount of time, we're going to develop cement dust in our lungs. And this cement dust in our lungs is problematic for all of us. It might affect different ones of us differently. Maybe the cement dust in my lungs makes me feel I'm less than, and the cement dust in somebody else's lungs makes him feel that he can, with equanimity, crush the life out of another human being with his knee for nine minutes and 29 seconds. Right? But it's problematic for all of us, even for people who don't recognize or won't acknowledge that they have cement dust in their lungs. But here's the question, what are we going to do about it? Well. There's a bunch of different strategies. Should we focus on the individual? Let me share with you two approaches that focus on the individual. The first one, I'm already gonna do a disclaimer. I don't love it. It has its pros and cons. Pros and cons, okay. Maybe we have a machine that scans people for how much cement dust they have in their lungs. And then if it finds somebody with too much dust, <coughs> an alarm goes off. Okay, so what are the problems with this? First of all, what is, how much is too much <laughs> cement dust? I would say any is. But also, what are we gonna do with the people with too much? Are we gonna put them on the edge of society, vote them off the planet? We can't do that, right? But the biggest problem of this is it makes people not even want to hear anything about cement dust. So now I'm gonna talk about racism. I'm gonna switch into, there are many people who don't want to say the word racism, who are in staunch racism denial because they think that when you say the word racism, you are actually trying to look at them and peer deeply into their souls to ask exactly how racist are you, right? So we don't want to, I mean, the advantage of it, the one pro, is it at least lets people know that they do have cement dust in their lungs. Here you're thinking about things like the um, implicit association test or other tests that, that, I don't know if you know about that computerized test of reaction times and stuff like that, but things that will just show you things that you don't recognize, you know, unconscious bias, implicit bias, all of that. But what if there are people who say, I know I have cement dust in my lungs and I want it out. Well, we could set up cleansing spas, right? And we could encourage, or people could volunteer to go into the cleansing spa, and they might read history and go across town and talk to strangers and come out as good as new. But if they come out into that same cloud of dust, they're going to reaccumulate cement dust in their lungs. So it's not a very permanent solution unless we make very big cleansing spas where everybody lives their whole lives, right? Which we could do. So, but it also, that last insight, they come back into the same cloud of dust. Do we need to acknowledge the cloud? Is that what we need to do? So what would that look like? Well, at least if I acknowledge that I wasn't born with cement dust in my lungs, but it's because I'm living in this cloud of cement dust that I haven't, it makes me want to put on a gas mask, <laughs> right? So that, so, so that at least I won't get new cement dust in my lungs, knowing that that gas mask in and of itself is not going to extract the cement dust that's already in my lungs. And I know I have to keep it on 24-7, so I'm actually heartened when I see myself reflected in a glass or a mirror to see my gas mask is still intact. But also, you guys might start noticing and ask, Dr. Jones, why are you wearing a gas mask? So I say, well, do you see that we're living in this cloud of cement dust? So it's like, you know, white supremacist culture or racism culture, or whatever. And more and more of you guys might start your own individual anti-cement dust journeys, because these are one by one. So you might start your own individual anti-cement dust journeys. And so maybe we hit on it, maybe that's the answer. All we need in the US are 330 million gas masks, tiny baby gas masks, old people gas masks. All you need here are 60 million, right? That's the last thing one, right? Well, it's a start. But what I think we really need to do is dismantle the factory. So especially those of us who have started our own individual anti-cement dust journeys, we need 
to move into action, and we need to get closer and closer and closer to the factory, which we're less afraid of doing because we have the gas mask and we can see more clearly and all. And then we need to ask the question, how is this factory operating here, looking at structures, policies, practices, norms, and values, and then we need to organize and strategize to act to dismantle this factory and put in its place a system in which all people can know and develop to their full potentials. So not only is this just kind of a little fanciful illustration that there are different levels of intervention we could take, but that, and that racism is a system, is not just cement dust, and it's not, doesn't just happen to individual things, not an individual attitudinal thing or whatever, it's a system, but it also points out that in order to really set things right, we must address racism or cement dust at the system's level. So very quickly, that question, how is the cement factory operating here, is the same as how is racism operating here. We need to, so racism is not a cloud. It's not a miasma that we can't get a handle on. It is a system with identifiable mechanisms in our structures, policies, practices, norms, and values, and I gave you a headache right then. Because you're like, what am I supposed to make with that? Structures, policies, practices, norms, and values, until you recognize, all of us recognize, that these are actually the elements of decision making. Where structures are the who, what, when, and where of decision making. Especially who's at the table and who's not, what's on the agenda, and what's not. And if st structures are who, what, when, and where of decision making, policies are the written how, practices and norms are both the unwritten how in different time frames, and values are the why. We can talk more about this later. I did want to go to say that Dr. King talked about uh, confronting racism denial. He says the value in pulling racism out of its obscurity and stripping it of its rationalizations, that is, of confronting racism denial, lies in the confidence that it can be changed. This is from his book, Where Do We Go From Here, his last book. Chaos or community. So what can we do today? My third call back to the, to the dual reality. Well, we need to actively look for evidence of two-sided science. Is there something differential going on by race, gender, uh, religion, community, uh, social class, all of these things, looking not just at opportunity, not just at outcomes, but also opportunity structures. We need to burst through our bubbles of experience, to experience our common humanity, to know that just across town there are people who are just as kind, funny, generous, hardworking, smart as we are, who are living in very different circumstances. Because when we experience that common humanity, we can start developing common cause. We need to be interested in the stories of others, and then believe the stories of others, and then join in the stories of others. And I think more people are doing that these days. We need to develop a sensitivity to the absence of who's not at the table, what's not on the agenda, what policies are not in place that have put in place would be quite productive toward racial ju social justice. We need to reveal inaction in the face of need because that's how structural racism most often manifests these days. But all the power is not just from those inside, those on the outside, we need to know our power. We need to know that action is power and especially that collective action is power because collective action informs us, inspires us, propels us, propels us and protects us. So happy birthday, Dr. King, and I am very happy to take your questions right now.